Welcome and good afternoon, everyone. I hope you are safe and well. I'm Sarah Rosen Wortel and privileged to be the president of the Urban Institute and to thank you for joining us. Some housekeeping notes, the event is being recorded and we will post the recording afterward online. All participate comments in the Q&A box at any time and they'll be fed to the moderators and join the conversation on social media, hashtag WorkRise. Today is the first installment in a series we're calling Launching WorkRise. Uh, we've all learned day-long conferences don't work so well over Zoom. So instead, we're hosting a series of short online conversations to explore bold new ideas for transforming the labor market for workers in low-wage jobs. Please check out the website and join us for the subsequent events on the next couple days. With founding support from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and the MasterCard Center for Inclusive Growth, WorkRise will be a new national platform for identifying, testing, and sharing big ideas for transforming the labor market. At this unprecedented moment of labor market stress and accelerated transformation, a moment of long overdue reckoning with racism's persistent grip on the labor market, there are many promising practices, policies, and programs being tested and tried all across the country. WorkRise will support research on these efforts to learn what works and what doesn't, as well as foundational research on rapidly changing labor market trends. WorkRise will get, generate data and evidence that strengthens employers' practices, informs policymaking, and provides genuine economic mobility and security for workers especially black and other people of color, women and young people who face systemic barriers to opportunity. WorkRise will also elevate existing knowledge across often siloed groups, creating a shared space and evidence-based conversation policymakers really listen to and learn from one another support from the Walmart Foundation, the Cognizant U.S. Foundation, the James Irvine Foundation, Annie E. Casey Foundation, and General Motors for this critical work. My sincere thanks to each of our funders for their commitment to work rise and to a better future for Americans have been poorly served by the country's labor market. Since the late 1970s, median wages have risen only modest, modestly, even as the productive capacity of workers and the overall economy have grown substantially. Benefits such as paid six time, family leave, and retirement savings continue to remain out of reach for many, including most gig workers. We've learned in this COVID crisis how important those are to safety, family, and security. And racial and gender gaps in wages, wealth, and unemployment rates persist with barriers to economic mobility continuing to mount. These and other long-standing inequities have been laid bare by these crises, COVID-19, the resulting economic fallout, and a national reckoning with structural racism. WorkRise will support research, including pilots and emerging solutions, not just to generate a report for the virtual shelf, but to yield actionable insights on policies, programs, and practices that can strengthen economic security and accelerate economic mobility for low-wage workers. WorkRise will generate new knowledge and evidence that can move policy and practice towards expanding opportunity and more equitable outcomes. WorkRise plans to invest more than $7 million in research grants over the next three years. Setting the agenda for the research and ensuring that every sector will engage with the findings is the job of WorkRise's amazing leadership board, a diverse group of visionary leaders across sectors that, like us, are committed to transforming the labor market. I encourage you to take a look at the website and see this extraordinary group who have joined us in this journey. My sincere thanks to each member of the leadership board for your time and energy. And I want to note, typically funders decide what work is important and what they want to fund. So it's a unique act of transformative trust to see decision making about the agenda to a broad leadership group. But by doing so, the funders in this project ensure that the work will have real resonance to the sectors that are represented on the leadership board. I want to make a special word of personal thanks to our long-term 
Time Economic Mobility Partner, Ryan Ripple at the Gates Foundation and Shamina Singh at the MasterCard Center for Inclusive Growth for being the first to take this brave design forward and leading other funders to it. And so now I'd like to introduce our two opening speakers. First, I am pleased to welcome Alan Goulston, president of the US program for the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Through the foundation's economic mobility program, Alan and his team have championed efforts to dramatically increase mobility opportunity for the workers. And then after we hear from Alan, we'll also hear from Mike Froman, who's chair of the MasterCard Center for Inclusive Growth and vice chairman and president for strategic growth at MasterCard. Mike uh, is a leader who has served in many roles in government and the private sector and in all been a strong proponent for placing workers and their families at the center of efforts to strengthen the economy and create a more equitable future. I thank you both for your partnership um, and commitment to this project. And with that, I'll turn it over to Alan. Thank you so much. Uh, good morning and good afternoon. And a huge thanks to Sarah for your kind words. My name is Alan Golston, and I'm the president of the US program for the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And I echo Sarah's opening comments that I hope your families are safe and healthy. It is impossible for me to overstate how proud that we are at the foundation to be part of the War Cries uh, platform and efforts, which I believe will prove to be a bold new national platform for ideas for how to transform the labor market for vulnerable workers. Our investment in WorkRise is in many ways a natural extension of our two decades of work in the United States. As we've worked for many, many years to improve our educational systems for students of color and students affected by poverty, we have seen how much of what affects a student's path through life depends on factors that exist outside the walls of the school. So several years ago, we began to explore ways to work on improving mobility for students and families. And we joined with the Urban Institute to examine these factors through the US Partnership on Mobility from Poverty, whose mission was to look at ways that all people could achieve a reasonable standard of living with the dignity that comes from having power over their own lives and being engaged and valued by their community. To build on the partnership's work of two years, the Gates Foundation in 2018 inaugurated our own program in economic mobility and opportunity. And our aim was to increase the capacity of the field to address systemic barriers to mobility from poverty, where we believe we can expand and extend the efforts already underway by many of the organizations and governments. And as part of that work, we invest in research and solutions that can help to improve the stability and upward mobility of vulnerable workers. And the WorkRise investment, which is among the largest that we have made so far in our economic mobility program, is just a natural outgrowth of that years long effort to ensure that there are more public private and social sector actors working together over the next decade to dramatically increase opportunity. And the launch of this effort feels particularly important as our nation grapples with a public health crisis and an economic crisis. And as COVID-19 didn't create the inequities that we see in today's labor market, we know it has certainly heightened them and made them more apparent. We see workers in low-wage jobs having to bear both the large share of layoffs and furloughs, as well as being often unable to work at home due to the nature of their jobs. And we know that means that their risk of exposure to the virus is higher than most. And this is only increasing the barriers to economic mobility faced by these workers. And there's a lot that we do know about what we need to do in this country to improve equity in the labor market. At the same time, there is a lot that we don't know. For example, how do worker power and voice shape mobility? How do employer practices in hiring, training, and scheduling impact long-term earning trajectories? How does structural racism impact the outcomes of training programs? And how do we ensure more 
equitable outcomes for years and decades and centuries to come. Building an equitable and resilient labor market, exposing the barriers to mobility, and building the awareness and the will to remove them is the goal of WorkRise. And by prioritizing and tackling the most important actionable knowledge gaps about how to support low-income workers, WorkRise will lead the way to scalable pilots and solutions that improve economic stability and mobility for workers in the United States. And that work has never felt more important. And in forming this alliance, we have taken a unique Big Tent approach. The leadership board, which drives the network's research and action agenda, brings together a diverse group of people from throughout the world of jobs and employment with a deep commitment to this mission. It draws upon their experience as experts from fields, from leaders at the SEIU and the AFL-CIO to the Chamber of Commerce, from the federal and local government to economists and sociologists specializing in employment issues, from those running workforce training programs to those who run a business. And we believe that to solve big problems, that you need engagement from across sector perspectives and that philanthropy at its best is when we empower and learn from people doing the work on the ground. And so we're glad that this initiative reflects that approach. Let me conclude by thanking each of you participating and let me extend my thanks to the other funders and sponsors of WorkRise. We hope that you enjoy the program and the array of speakers who will join the program over the next several days. Thank you. And now I'll turn it over to Michael Froman. Michael? Thanks very much, uh, Alan and Sarah, for having me. And first, let me just say, I'm in violent agreement with what both of you have already laid out. We are so excited to be part of WorkRise and to participate uh, in this launch and see it as this national coordinated platform that brings together truly diverse voices to help identify, elevate, and scale innovative solutions to the challenges of lifting up low mobility workers in the United States. Uh, I want to underscore Sarah's emphasis on actionable insights. We are very excited. And, and the panelists that you'll hear from today and over the next few days, as well as the leadership board, uh, they are particularly impressive. And so we are uh, very much, uh, very much looking forward to uh, hearing from them in the days and months ahead. Our investment in WorkRise is a natural next step in our effort at MasterCard to focus on financial inclusion, which we've been doing for the better part of a decade. Uh, five years ago, we committed to bring half a billion unbanked individuals into the financial system around the world. We managed it like any other corporate objective, with people having goals and programs. We achieved it about nine months ahead of time. And in the midst of COVID, uh, we looked around and said the job is certainly not done. There's still over 1.7 billion people outside the financial system, over a billion people around the world who lack a digital or any kind of identity. And therefore we recommitted to raise our, our goal to a billion individuals, 50 million micro and small merchants, 25 million women owned, women run businesses to bring into the digital economy. And as our work evolves from financial inclusion to inclusive growth, the role of workers and workers' ability to navigate the changing nature of work itself uh, very much came to the fore. Uh, whether it's helping people get paid however they want to get paid, whether they're coffee growers in Mexico, uh, workers in Egypt, or a gig worker in the United States, those have been areas that we've been very much focused on. And this recent crisis has really laid bare, as Alan said, the structural inequities uh, in the labor market, the unequal impact of the pandemic. We know that the losses caused by the pandemic, the economic losses, as well as the health losses, have not been uh, evenly distributed. And while the unemployment rate has recently fallen to 7.9%, 
it's still 12.1% for black workers and 10.3% for Latinx workers. Uh, unemployment is growing faster among women than it is for men. And black owned businesses are more than twice as likely to close down in this economic, in the early months of this economic crisis than uh, white owned uh, businesses. Um, so there's a lot of work to be done to create a dignified, secure, basis of work or reliable safety net that includes the capability of engaging in lifelong learning, of getting access to, to portable benefits, all of which can help workers get on and stay on a path to greater uh, prosperity. And we see this platform and WorkRise is very much contributing to the practical, practical actionable solutions, um, a call for action, collaboration, collective ownership, shared learning in this, uh, in this area. Uh, we're excited that it is multidimensional, that it includes governments, labor, nonprofits, as well as the business uh, community, and I uh, look forward to seeing what the results are there. And finally, let me just thank, of course, Sarah and the Urban Institute, uh, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, the Walmart Foundation, Cognizant US Foundation, the Anne E. Casey, Foundation, the James Irvine Foundation, and General Motors for all coming together to launch this effort. Uh, I think this really is the beginning of something very promising uh, and very important at this critical time. And with that, let me introduce Donald Marin, who's going to moderate our opening uh, panel. He's an Institute Fellow and Director of Economic Policy Initiatives at the Urban Institute. Uh, he served in many government positions, including as a member of the President's Council of Economic Advisors and as acting director of the Congressional Budget Office. Uh, over to you, Donald. Great, thanks, Michael. Uh, it's a real honor to be here to help launch WorkRise. Uh, as Sarah Allen and Michael noted in their remarks, uh, workers in low and middle wage jobs have not fully benefited from the economic growth we've seen in recent decades. Uh, many workers in low wage jobs and industries find it difficult to move up the wage and occupational ladder and far too many struggle to save, to buy a home, or to send their kids to college. So why did this happen? How did our economy in general, and our labor market in particular, end up this way? To understand the why and the how, I'm joined today by four experts who have grappled deeply with these questions. Uh, I ask them to turn on their video and join us at this point. Right, so uh, allow me to welcome uh, Heather Boucher, uh, she's president and CEO of the Washington Center for Equitable Growth. Uh, Jason Furman, who's professor of the practice of economic policy at the Harvard Kennedy School. Derek Hamilton, uh, Henry Cohen professor of economics and urban policy and university professor at the New School. Uh, and Michael Strain, director of economic policy studies at the American Enterprise Institute. Uh, thank you all for joining us. Uh, Heather, I'd like to start with you, uh, if you could kick us off kind of big picture with a, a basic overview of trends of upward mobility in recent decades uh, and what important differences are across race, gender, uh, and geography. Thanks. Uh, that's a lot, but I'll give it a, I'll give it a go. Um, thank you, and I'm very excited to be a part of this launch today. Um, I think it's a really exciting project, and you know, thank you for including me, and, and I'm excited to see the work in the years to come. So let me just give you a bit of the landscape of what's been happening with economic mobility. And I'm gonna rely, of course, a lot on the work of Raj Chetty and many of his colleagues, um, who's done some of the most pathbreaking work on mobility in recent years. And let me start with one of their key findings, which is that when you look at folks who were born in the 1940s, and how many of them grew up to out earn their parents. We find that about 90% by the time they get to adult age are out earning, out earning their parents. When you fast forward to those who were born in 1980, however, those folks as they're growing up, getting into the labor market are um, far less likely to be out earning their parents. Only about half of them are. So this is a, a, a quite remarkable shift in upward economic mobility over just a couple of generations um, and a real change in how we think about mobility in the United States. One of the things that they found in their research that I think is really important to emphasize as we're thinking about the basic trends for mobility is that when you look at the period over that latter half of the 20th century into the 21st century and you start to ask why, 
we see less mobility now than we did in the middle of the 20th century. There are two big aggregate trends that folks look to. One is changes in economic inequality, and the other is changes in economic growth. Right? Growth is slowed a little bit overall, and inequality is, of course, widened. And one of the things that they find in their work, uh, Raj Chetty and his colleagues, is that we would actually have to close the inequality gap in order to see less mobility. They did some counterfactuals and looked at those folks born in 1940 and their trajectory and those folks born in 19, the early 1980s and their trajectories and found that about 70% of the gap um, between their two trends would have to be changed by going back to the kind of less inequality that we saw in the middle of the 20th century. So I think it's always important as we're thinking about mobility to understand that um, economic inequality is the context in which people are growing up, raising their families, and then walking into that labor market and trying to get those jobs. So these two things go hand in hand. Now, of course, we haven't just seen an increase um, or a decrease in mobility um, intergenerationally. We've, of course, seen it intragenerational as well. So when you look at research, and I'll just point to one study, research by Emily Weimers and Michael Carr, who looked at the wage trajectories of different workers over a 15-year uh, time, 15-year period, starting about the age of 30, going back to the early 1980s, they actually found that workers who are near the middle of the earnings distribution at the age of 30 are now 20% less likely to make it into the top wage bracket. So you're seeing folks less likely to move up. And so they call this, it's not just a winner take all labor market, but a winner takes early labor market. Folks are getting their place in the wage hierarchy earlier in their careers, and then they're, they're able to hold on to it. Because that's the flip side of mobility. It isn't just folks moving up, is how is it that we are creating um, the openness for folks to do that? And, um, I want to end with just one, um, uh, you listed a number of uh, factors to focus on, uh, gender, race, geography. Let me just um, pull together a little bit of notes on race and geography, which hopefully we'll come back to, as especially as we're talking about policy recommendations. But one of the things that we've seen, again, this is also from research by Raj Chetty and his colleagues, is that um, place, and especially places that have high concentrations of Black Americans, uh, have less upward mobility. And so this is from a series of papers that they did a couple of years ago with all of these fantastic maps. And if any of the, I see 439 people on the call have not seen them, I highly recommend you do. Um, but they, they looked at the data sort of at a micro level and found that areas with large black population shares are also areas where black Americans um, experience particularly low levels of economic mobility. So it isn't just this sort of generalized trend. It's something that's playing across, across, playing out across place and by race in the United States. I'll end there and uh, hopefully we can come back to some of these topics as the conversation goes on. Absolutely, thanks. Uh, so Jason, turning to you next. Uh, obviously these are big longstanding issues that we would we'd naturally be having a conversation about right now. But in addition, we now have this new overlay of uh, the pandemic and the COVID crisis we've been going through. Uh, and so I guess the question there is kind of what unique new challenges that poses and uh, which of them are going to be sticky and which of them might fade away. Yeah, um, thanks um, so much, Donald, and for this, this great effort that all of you are engaged in. Um, first, let's just think of what we're going through right now as a normal recession. That will be a bad enough story, and then we'll layer um, some of what is unique on top of it. The US labor market has become increasingly less dynamic and less fluid in the last several decades. Um, there's a lot of debates about you know, why this has happened, um, what's happened to make it so that we're creating and destroying fewer jobs, people are moving less, switching less between occupations, industries, and the like. Um, but whatever those causes, one of the consequences is that when a recession hits, um, you are, and you lose your job, you have a much harder time getting back into a job. Um, you might end up being um, stuck out of the labor market and become long-term unemployed. You might um, give up entirely and leave the labor force. 
um, you might have to take the first job you can desperately get and work part time um, for economic reasons in an involuntary manner. Um, we saw this in the relatively mild recession in 2001. We saw it in the very severe um, financial crisis. And I'm very much worried now that we're going to see a dynamic that the recovery in the labor market, especially um, in terms of long-term unemployed, labor force participation, and part-time work, will be just a very, very prolonged process. Um, one that would take, you know, could easily take five years or more just to get us back to where we were in February of this year. Um, and in February of this year, there were a lot of structural problems, many of which Heather um, has talked about. So all of that is what happens in a normal recession when it hits an economy like the one um, we have now with a less dynamic and fluid labor market. Um, this, of course, isn't a normal recession. You had an incredibly high level of unemployment for um, a short period of time. Now you just have a very, very high level of unemployment. Um, you have what is likely to be a big reallocation shock of many industries are much smaller um, for a period to come and, and hopefully other industries grow and take their place. But that involves people you know, moving jobs between industries, um, between employers um, and the like. And all of this is something that we know um, from comparing labor markets around the world that you know, just getting out of the way and having a pure free market and no labor unions, no minimum wage, whatever, um, doesn't work. It doesn't um, help connect. It doesn't just um, fall short in terms of wages. It also falls short in terms of having um, the type of infrastructure we need to connect um, people um, to jobs, to opportunities. And that's going to be just essential to even get back uh, to where we were prior to COVID hitting, and a whole lot more is going to be needed to improve on that starting point. Great, thanks. Uh, so now Derek, and then I will go with uh, to Michael as well. Um, so obviously we have this uh, particular crisis associated with COVID, uh, but then we've also had these longer run trends. Uh, many of those trends are due to choices uh, that we've made as a society, uh, economically and politically. Uh, and if you just uh, highlight uh, what you think uh, for Derek first, uh, kind of what the, what the key choices that we've made are that have gotten us to this place. Well, thank you, Donald, for moderating this panel. Thank you, WorkRise, for this endeavor. And thank you, colleagues, for uh, allowing me to share the stage with you. Um, I do want to uh, go back to race and geography just for a quick second and, and just point out that we need to be careful not to euphemize racism with geography that uh, underneath what we mean by geography might just be structural racist uh, society where black people hap happen to live. And it, you know, it leads to another point, which is, I think we need to identify the mechanisms when we talk about geography and race as well. Because on the one hand, one might ascribe resources to black neighborhoods as being depleted and not, not plentiful. Um, but we still have this narrative of cultural poverty. And you know, I want to point out there's nothing wrong with Black people living next to each other, going to school with each other. We very well might aesthetically desire to have diverse and integrated societies, but we need to be careful with our terminologies to be more precise and say that if it's a resource issue or if it's you know, not having access to um, public services, then those are the mechanisms that need to be identified. Um, answer your question, I'd say we don't have a social safety net in, in place. We've, we've gutted our social safety net over time. Uh, we have instead offered policies around deregulation and lower taxes on the wealthy with the expectation that that's going to create a corporate dynacism that will trickle down to all of us. Um, but, you know, uh, the trickle down has not been realized over the last 45 plus years, as was pointed out with data earlier. Um, I think we also need to stop thinking in terms of economics and politics being separable and recognize that our rhetoric around the role of markets is very political. A notion that markets become the fair, efficient, colorblind arbiter of our worth and the most efficient distribution of resources is not devoid of politics. 
And in, in truth, I would add another pillar to that relationship of economics and politics, which is race. That we describe the efficiency of markets as being the arbiter um, in a culture of poverty thesis. Some notion that those that are not achieving on the lower end are somehow engaging in activities or behaviors that are detrimental to their own success. And that's highly racialized. It's highly, highly based, based in a caricatures of black people as being welfare queens trying to get over on the get over and con the government to get resources that they don't need because uh, they choose not to work. Uh, super predators, that's another, another narrative. I can keep going on and on and on. And it spills over onto white people as well. When we have a term like white trash, that is meant to other poor white people from a normative perspective of good white people. So, you know, I, I think that if we are to move, head, move ahead with this endeavor, we really need to think about politics, economics, and stratification, identity stratifications, as not issues that are separable, but as three-legged stools that lead to a, a better understanding of our political economy. And, and, you know, let me also say that the notion that it is deficit behavior on those that are not achieving as the explanation of inequality has the causality wrong. It is more likely that lack of resources leads to decisions that one might see after the fact and describe as, as problematic. In other words, if you don't have resources, then you turn to predatory lending. You don't turn to predatory lending when you have resources. You do because you don't have access to, to you know, more prime lending. That's an example. Um, so, you know, I, I'd say, I, I know I'm talking a lot. Let me finish with two points and say that we need to focus on economic rights. We need to recognize that we need our greatest resource, which is our people, to have um, an adequate amount of resources in areas that are so self-determining in life outcomes that without them, people really have no agency. And those, you know, education, housing, capital, um, a job, basic income, you know, I could keep going, um, but our industrial policy has to think about workers. Our industrial policy has to recognize that America's best resource is its people. And when we invest in our people, we generate a dynamism that we ascribe to corporations. If we invest in our people to build up our infrastructure, we create opportunities for corporate sectors. We, and, we do, and we do it in a shared prosperity way. Great, thanks. Michael? Uh, thank you. Sorry, I was on mute there. Um, let, me, let me begin by uh, uh, thanking everybody for tuning in, and, and it's an honor to be part of the WorkRise effort, and it, it's just such an important uh, initiative. I'm, I'm, I'm thrilled to be here and, and, and thrilled to be on the, on the board. Um, I would push back a little bit on the premise. Uh, you know, I think that there is a, a, a narrative of stagnation, a narrative of immobility, a narrative that uh, there's something fundamentally broken in our economy, and that hard work doesn't pay off, and that and that uh, uh, and that and that people can't get ahead. And I think that that narrative is overstated. If you look at the last several decades, I think you see uh, a significant increase in living standards, a uh, significant increase in, in in wages and incomes. Uh, and you see that, I think, throughout the distribution. Now, of course, the increases are much, much higher for, for people at the, at the top, even higher for people at the top 1%. But if you look at the median, if you look at, at, at uh, deciles below the median, um, you, you still see uh, advancement. I think the, the best evidence suggests that, that the primary driver of wages is productivity. Um, uh, uh, which suggests that a fundamental moral property of the capitalist system, that, that people get uh, what they deserve in some sense, that, that, there, that there are returns to hard work uh, uh, and talent and, and opportunity still holds. Um, if you look at rates of upward economic mobility, even from the bottom, uh, if you had to choose to characterize the United States as either upwardly mobile or upwardly immobile, I think you would choose upwardly mobile. Some recent research I've done suggests that uh, people who were, who were raised in the bottom 
have an 86% chance of out earning their uh, parents at comparable ages. Um, having said all that, I think that we should not be complacent and that we should do much, much better, uh, particularly with respect to low income Americans and the working class. And so I agree that we have serious problems uh, and that we need real policy solutions to help advance economic opportunity and, and to build on, on uh, whatever success we've had over the past few decades. Donald, to answer your question directly, kind of how did we, how did we get here? I think the answer is just one of priorities. Um, and uh, I, th I think that was part of Derek's answer and, and a part that I'm, that I'm happy to agree with. One of the most striking things that's happened in the past several years, I, I think, is the 2017 Republican tax law that uh, reduced tax revenue by you know, around $1.5 trillion, but couldn't come up with 60 billion to expand the earned income tax credit for childless workers, despite the fact that that is a policy that President Obama championed and that Speaker Paul Ryan himself championed. That's just, that's just a sign of, of, of where uh, that policy initiative ranked in terms of priorities. And in my view, it ranked much, much too low. I think this is a bipartisan problem. Uh, I, I, I see a lot of effort from presidents and, and, and White Houses and Congresses of both parties um, putting uh, policies that would help the middle class ahead of policies that would help the poor putting policies that would make life more comfortable for people in the middle ahead of policies that would truly advance economic opportunity for low income Americans. And that's something I think that, that we need to change. And that needs to be a bipartisan effort. Members of both parties, uh, scholars from the progressive perspective, scholars from the conservative perspective need, I think, to just bump that up a little higher on the on the priority list, there's lots of, of, of low hanging fruit there. Uh, there's a lot we don't know, and that's one of the reasons why I'm so excited about WorkRise. There's a real opportunity to learn what policies work, what policies don't, what is uh, the actual state of, of, of economic circumstances among different low income communities and in, in, in different parts of the country. How can we formulate better policies based on an improved understanding there's just lots and lots of work to do here. And, and I'm uh, uh, confident that WorkRise is gonna contribute quite a bit to, to some of that work getting done. Great, thanks. And uh, just a reminder for everybody participating, if uh, you have questions you'd like the panelists to address, please use the Q&A box and uh, we'll have uh, uh, some room and uh, some time uh, uh, toward the end here to try to get to some of those. Uh, so keeping on the theme of uh, choices, uh, start with Jason and then Heather. Uh, instead of looking backwards, we, we can now look forward. Uh, and ask uh, what different choices should we make? We've already touched on this a little bit, but what different choices should we make about how we govern uh, labor markets, financial markets, and other markets uh, in order to promote upward mobility through labor markets? Uh, Jason, I'll start with you. Great. So, um, you know, Donald, this is sort of consistent with my worry about coming out of the recession we're in. Um, in some ways, I'm worried about inequality and who has jobs and who doesn't even more than I'm worried about income inequality. And I'm, and I'm pretty worried about um, income you know, inequality. You know, to be excluded um, from society, to be in a position where you're not working is um, you know, really just profound in terms of its implications for you, for your family, for your community um, and beyond. And so I think that you know, what we can do to raise employment, to connect more people to jobs is you know, the most important thing. Um, in the short run, it's limiting the damage from the recession. It's passing a fiscal stimulus and relief bill as quickly as possible. Um, in the medium run, to some degree, it's gonna be about not just aggregate demand overall, um, but demand for certain types of jobs, things like investment and in infrastructure, which can create um, certain types of jobs. You know, institutional changes that, um, you know, education is really critical. Employment rates are much higher for people with higher degrees of educational attainment. With a higher degree of educational attainment, you're not recession-proof, but you're closer to recession-proof than you would have been 
um, without that. So I think all of that um, is part of it. And then um, training, job search assistance, um, et cetera. To do this, we'll need to look at every one of the programs we ever have, we, we have, and ask, can they be made um, better? Unemployment insurance, we saw a lot of the deficiencies of it going into the crisis we're in now. Some of them have been temporarily um, patched over and fixed um, for a short period of time, but a lot more needs to happen to make UI both better protect people, but also better launch them into jobs. I'd support some new things, like for example, wage insurance that says if you can't, you know, don't just insure somebody against having no earnings, insure them against having um, subpar earnings if they're an older worker and it's going to be harder for them um, to, to get into a job. So I think we need to look at everything we do now. We need to look at what we need to add. Um, I was negligent not even talking about workplace flexibility, um, paid leave, child care, sick leave, all of that is really integral to getting more people into the workforce, enabling them to stay in it, um, contributing to our economy and you know, contributing to their own families and lives. Great, thanks. Heather? Yeah, so um, thanks, Jason, and thanks for ending on the care economy pieces. I'll, um, I will also end on those pieces. Um, but let me just make um, one comment about some of the policies we need to think about to tie into some of the points that Derek made. So one of the things that we know is that different places invest differently in folks and that this sets the scene for how people will, um, what kinds of skills folks have when they start, when they enter the labor market. So one of the early studies that we funded at Equitable Growth was by scholars um, Julian Lafortune, um, Jesse Rothstein, and Diane Whitmore Schatzenbach, who looked at student achievement across high and low income school districts and asked, um, you know, what does school financing mean for student outcomes? And they found that um, school districts that um, experienced these sharp and immediate and sustained spending increases in low income districts actually led to slow and steady increases in the test scores of students in those low income districts. And I just wanted to underscore that as a really important part of the de development of the human capital, of the skills that folks have, and the role that, you know, the way we finance um, primary and secondary education, the role of place, and how that plays across different communities um, and just in, in, uh, in a response to, I think, Derek's really well taken points about this isn't about um, race, it's more likely about structural racism. Uh, so I, I wanted to start there. But second, I want to note as we're thinking about mobility, uh, we often focus on the folks that we want to be upwardly mobile. We focus on their skills. I just started this conversation by talking about, well, how can we improve educational outcomes for kids across different kinds of communities? But just as importantly, and Jason talked about this, we have to think about the economy that folks are entering into. And this is where especially the rise in sustained economic inequality over recent decades, the rise in concentration across industries has changed the landscape of the kind of economy folks are entering. And we need to think about what policies are gonna open up opportunity and create pathways, pathways to upward mobility. So um, it's not just about individual skills, but it's about how we're gonna help folks deploy those skills and open up pathways. So we need to think about things like, you know, raising the minimum wage. We know this is one of the most important anti-poverty policies we have. We know that it doesn't just affect those whose wages are increased, but it, it inches up the wage ladder. And we know that there's not um, uh, evidence that it leads to employment declines of economically meaningful, in economically meaningful amounts. So that's one really important sort of labor demand side piece. And I think we should all, you know, one takeaway from this conversation should be the points that Jason made that this COVID recovery is going to be incredibly tough. We have this very bifurcated labor market pre-pandemic and afterwards we see so many folks who could telecommute, who could work at home, who could um, address their issues around care, have been able to keep their jobs and are doing just fine economically, even if not psychologically or health-wise. And then you have all these folks who've lost their jobs, who are on the front lines, who both have the health issues and the job issues. Um, and these are going to be with us for some time to come. So how can we make sure to support them? Raising the minimum wage is one, making sure that workers are counted as workers. 
Um, misclassification is a significant issue, one that is played out in 2020 in really new and interesting ways. Um, you know, Uber was right out there in front saying, hey, we want our workers to be covered by the unemployment insurance benefits that you're giving um, because they are out of a job right now too. But in fact, they had um, really lobbied hard to not have to pay the taxes into the system, which is a part of the challenge that Jason talked about, that we need to make sure that all work workers who need these social insurance benefits um, are adequately protected, that we're making sure that the taxes are being paid into the system so that when they need the benefits, they are there. And that starts with counting folks as workers. Um, we need to do more to increase working bargaining power and strengthen unions. Again, this has shown up in 2020. We know that folks who have a union more likely to have that protective gear that they've needed, more likely to be able to bargain over better wages and working conditions um, and to support workers and their families. So what can we do to ensure that we don't um, uh, over the next decade to continue to have fewer people in the private sector in a union than before we made unions legal, uh, the right to bargain collectively legal back in the 1930s. How can we reverse that trend? And then finally, I wanna end where Jason ended. If there's one thing that we've learned from 2020, it's that workers cannot be successful in the labor market. They cannot move up if they do not have access to the care supports that they, they need. And that's everything from making sure daycare is available to making sure that schools are functioning and have hours that work for parents. Um, and that's something that we've really seen come to the forefront. We've seen sharp drops in women's labor force participation over the past few months, alongside the fact that so many schools are still telecommuting and folks are having to homeschool. You can't have a vibrant 21st century economy if you don't find ways to help families address care. And that there's two sides to that coin that is really important for mobility, one for the worker who needs the care, but also for those care workers who are also exactly the kind of workers who we want to be providing those upward mobility paths for. So I think all of those go together, but it really is focusing on the labor market uh, side, things we can do. That I think is where the, the, the real wins in the policy realm are going to be. Okay, thanks. Uh, so Michael, turning to you, uh, so obviously there's a great potential for policy actions to encourage upward mobility through labor markets. Uh, are there also things that uh, employers and other private actors ought to be doing? Well, there may be. Um, one of the most important uh, developments in the U.S. economy in the last half century has been a deterioration in the strength of the worker firm relationship. And there are many reasons why that, that relationship is weaker than it used to be. A lot of those reasons are driven by decisions that, that workers have made about, about their own careers. And, and, and much of it, of course, is also driven by, by business decisions, perhaps responding to a to a more competitive environment. But as an economy, we've gotten away from uh, kind of the old model where a business would hire workers with general skills, a business would invest in training workers to do the kinds of, of, of tasks that, that the business needs done, knowing that that might mean that the worker is not super productive for, for six months or, or nine months uh, at the beginning of his tenure. Um, and, then where, and then where a worker stays in a firm long enough for the firm to recoup that investment um, and, uh, uh, and, 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 and the firm absorbs economic shocks and doesn't result, doesn't resort to layoffs as readily, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, it, is, it is possible that we have gone much too far in the direction of kind of a textbook purely competitive labor market with respect to management practices. And it may, it may be that a business could increase its profitability by paying workers higher wages uh, and by investing in workers and by attempting to create an environment where workers want to stick around. There are very well-grounded uh, reasons in, in economic theory and evidence why that dynamic might unfold if a business decided to take that, that path. Promisingly, there are some companies that are that are starting to do some experiments with this, uh, voluntarily raising their wages well above the minimum wage, starting training academies, and 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 and, and ramping up uh, the investment they're making in workers. These are these are relatively younger efforts, uh, but uh, it it very well may be, and I wouldn't be surprised at all if 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 what we end up discovering is that that's a 
that's a practice that's good for workers, but also good for a business's bottom line. So I think this is just another area where we need where we need more research and, and, and we need to know more. But you're right, it's not, it's not just uh, public policy, it's also business policy. And I think this conversation has let businesses off the hook to, uh, to, to an unfortunate degree. Great, thanks. Uh, so Derek, uh, you already touched on this a little bit in your previous remarks, uh, but if you think about issues uh, related to racial opportunity gaps, racial outcome gaps, uh, are there any particular lever levers at the macro level that you think are, are most potentially productive? Yeah, and, and you know, in thinking about race, we can start with the notion of whether our economy adequately rewards hard work and education. There's a paradox when we look at race that you find when black people acquire more education, not only do racial disparities persist, they often worsen. You know, if we look at the domain of wealth, it is the case that a black family where the head is full-time employed, they typically have less wealth than a white family where the, head drop, where the head is not employed. And similarly with education, you get that similar bifurcation where a black family where the head graduated from college typically has less wealth than a white family where the head dropped out of high school. Of course, wealth is not something that we often think of as a labor market reward. Rather, we know that wealth is generated in an intergenerational way. Um, but these lessons aren't just limited to wealth. And by the way, some of the power of wealth is not it as an outcome, but the agency it affords. Like when there is a pandemic, to be able to withstand job loss, or if you have a pre-existing condition, make a decision not to go into work as an essential worker and put yourself at risk. But these disparities persist with health outcomes as well. And there I see a more direct connection to labor market also. And you know, we know that the typical disparity for um, individuals age 25 to I think 60, if you're black, there's about a 50% higher mortality than if you're white. But then if you look at only blacks and whites with a college degree, that disparity goes to a 70% higher mortality. And I wonder if the stigma attached to trying to overcome your burdens, you know, uh, this is a phrase I've said before, oftentimes black people, women even here growing up, you're gonna face labor market discrimination. You need to work twice as hard to get by. The question we don't ask with that rhetoric is at what cost? So if we have a political economy that doesn't adequately reward education in a fair way, we very well end up with some of these immoral outcomes, in my view, as a result of the stigma in place. But in terms of you know, what we can do from a macro perspective, reparations is the most direct and parsimonious approach. And the, you know, there's obvious questions about fees, political feasibility. Um, but that said, uh, HR 40 was almost the democratic platform position where all the candidates said that they would support it if the bill came up across their desk. So that's progress. So whether we're ready to take on the challenges of the past, at some point, if we're ever going to get to racial healing, we will have to, in my view, implement a reparations program. And again, that might not occur tomorrow or today, but at some point, I believe it will, and we should focus on it. Um, and it, it would entail a truth and reconciliation, which would lead us to have an authentic understanding of not only racial disparity, but poverty more broadly in America, and that we would place poverty and resource deprivation as opposed to some of our other political narratives about a lack of effort on the part of poor people. And then, of course, it would be empty without redress. But what we can do that is more politically feasible at this current moment is, I think, shift towards an economic rights frame that recognize that tinkering is not going to solve these problems. And in fact, we see political movements amongst young people like millennials who came of age during the Great Recession. Uh, we told them to go to college and wait out the Great Recession. They got saddled with record levels of debt and now they're about to face additional scarring from this pandemic. Well, to me, it might not be a surprise that they're clamoring for a more dramatic change in our political economy than other generations. But what economic rights would do for black people is you know, we would do it in a different way than we did with the New Deal, rather than one that excludes Blacks in Social Security because they're domestic or agricultural workers. We should intentionally think about 
big, bold policies that explicitly include people based on their race and gender, even if they're race neutral, like baby bonds, capital at birth, um, like portable benefits, like our colleagues have been talking about earlier, um, like a federal job guarantee that directly employs anybody that desires to work in a job that's building our public physical and human infrastructure in a way that makes us more resilient to the next pandemic, climate catastrophe, and the everyday vulnerabilities that poor people face. Great, thanks. Uh, so then our uh, last question for the panel before we turn to uh, some audience uh, questions, uh, and this can be for whoever wants to, whichever combination of folks wants to weigh in, uh, which is either what one fear about the future economic environment uh, do you have and how can we head it off? Uh, or if you want to take a positive spin on the question, what hope do you have for the future economic environment uh, and how can we encourage it? And I'm just going to read body language. Okay, Heather looks like she has an answer. Michael didn't have his microphone muted. I thought he could go. Anyway, I'll, I'll go. Um, <laughs> I have no hope, Heather. <laughs> um, I'll go and then someone else can. So, um, so I, I want to say, my, uh, you know, Jason's already uh, talked about the fear, but I, I think it can't be said enough. I, I am very fearful that a K-shaped recovery will continue unabated, um, or is actually what I wrote about a sideways Y, because it's sort of the same thing. Um, but I think that you know we really need to be thinking about um, this bifurcated recovery and taking steps to fix it. Um, but because I am a characteristically optimistic person, I want to end on a hope, um, which is that I really um, am, have been excited to see all of the energy and new ideas around being able to connect the dots between a climate change agenda and a recovery agenda. And so I actually feel quite hopeful that um, perhaps in 2021, we can come up with some new ideas that can get implemented, that can you know, make sure that we have a habitable planet with resources that we can use for generations to come. So that is my hope. Great, Michael? Um, I, uh, you know, I, I am hopeful, um, over an appropriate time horizon. Uh, I think, I think that we have made significant progress on, on these issues. We've made significant progress on advancing economic opportunity. We've even made progress on figuring out what policies work and what policies don't. And, and we've shown an ability to, uh, to correct, um, if you look at a, you know, longer time horizon. Uh, that pro progress is halting. It often kind of feels like one step forward and two steps back. Um, but I think if you look over the last 100 years or so, you know, you, you are, you know, left with the conclusion that, that there has actually been considerable progress here. Um, and I, I expect that that will, that will continue. Um, that may not sound very hopeful, so let me say something that's that's even more hopeful. Uh, you know, one of the one of the things that I think was was um, most surprising about the government's response to the pandemic was the uh, audacity and ambition and scope of the CARES Act. Uh, whether or not you support the Paycheck Protection Program, whether or not you support the $600 federal supplement to standard state provided unemployment benefits. Uh, these, are, these are really big creative programs uh, that I think are pretty far outside the scope of what most analysts would have thought Congress could possibly do. And that suggests to me that, that there is greater uh, room in our in our political system for doing big and bold things if policymakers think that the need is really there. And I think that that suggests an important responsibility among the policy community at identifying the need, communicating the need in a way that resonates, uh, and in suggesting uh, more creative and more ambitious proposals. I think we have evidence that that, that can work. Um, and, uh, and, and, and maybe, maybe it can work again. Great. So Michael stole my bit of hope, which is we just have had a horrible shock to the economy, not to mention our society, and had initially um, a very large, ambitious and progressive um, response to it, not a response that was perfect. The fact that it ended at the end of July is particularly terrible. 
Um, but there's at least a glimmer um, of hope there. I think we don't know the solution to all of our problems. So, you know, I do think the usual academic conclusion of more research is needed um, is warranted very much so on this topic um, as well. Thus, uh, WorkRise, thus you know, some of the other organizations around the table here. But I think there are some of the answers we do know. And we can get started on um, right away. Things like high quality preschool and paid leave, just to name two, and, and certain things about how to design both of those um, we could go off and do tomorrow. Both of them would help um, our labor markets and society more broadly. I, is it my turn last but not yep. least? <laughs> or maybe last and least? No, no. <laughs> my, my, my hope comes from young people, uh, and maybe I'm being naive, but you know, a question is, is this generation generationally different or are they in the life cycle that at a certain point, uh, their political attitudes might uh, revert back to the status quo as well? I don't know the answer to that question. I believe that they're generationally different. So when I see social movements in the street that include people from a wide swath of life clamoring that Black Lives Matter, that gives me hope. But I'm not naive. I also recognize that in those political movements, you have militias, armed militias, uh, that literally shoot and kill people. So that doesn't give me hope. But ultimately, here's, here's how I think the question is best answered. Commit to justice. Commit to justice as a dogma. So regardless of the circumstances, commit to a society that we think is morally sustainable and the right type of society that we want. And that should be all the hope we need to continue our efforts. Great, thanks. All right, now I'm gonna, I'm gonna turn over here to some questions that have come in from the audience. Uh, the first one, uh, early in our conversation, there was a really interesting uh, discussion about the issues of place. Uh, and so uh, Heather noted that Raj Chetty's research indicates lower economic mobility in regions with a higher percentage of black residents uh, and then Derek uh, raised this point that that's associated with political choices made by white majorities in the 20th century to disinvest uh, in some public resources in those regions. Uh, and that as a result, economic mobility is lower for both blacks and whites in those places. And so then the question is, uh, which public policies and investments uh, would, be, would, would be most productive uh, in increasing economic mobility in those places? I'll, I'll jump in. I, I think we have to be concerned about potential gentrification and um, trying to incentivize outsiders to come in and develop neighborhoods that lead to unintended consequences. So um, I'm not a fan of opportunity zones. I think a better way of, of, of uh, improving neighborhoods would be to provide the existing residents those resources more directly. But if you try to uh, encourage capital to come in, uh, you may have some benefits, but you also are empowering capital in a way that distorts power dynamics and power relationships where they also have the potential to exploit and extract. Let me, let me say one other point about that. You know, we have things like um, tax abatements to try to promote home ownership in certain neighborhoods to bring more resources. But some of the existing residents don't have the capital foundations in the first place to benefit from the tax abatement. I mean, I'm, I'm glad that Heather and her colleagues are talking about making all taxes refundable. I think that's a good thing. Um, but I also think we got to go even further and revert back to American history when we provided literal entitlements and grants to populations, but we did so in a way that excluded people based on identity. So we can revert back to those policies and ensure that people have enough initial capital to get into an asset that will appreciate over their lifetime. Do either of the other two panelists want to weigh in on this one or? Michael? Only if you want me to. Sure, just uh, say something quick. I'm gonna check the other questions. I, I shared Derek's skepticism about opportunity zones, but um, but uh, for a different reason. I don't I don't think that they they will work. Um, uh, you know, they're 
there are just too many opportunities, I think, to, to game the system. Uh, and, um, you know, it's, it's not obvious to me why uh, we would think that, um, that government planners, by designating zip codes and neighborhoods, might know better where capital should, should flow and, and, where, and, where, and where, it will, where it will find a good use than, than either typical market forces or, I think, I agree with, with Derek than, than people who are already there. Great. Alrighty. So, uh, so next question, uh, and this is basically, this is a question about uh, tight labor markets, uh, which uh, if we remember back early this year, there, there was a, a pre-COVID time where we were beginning to have a discussion about whether the labor market was actually getting tight. Um, so the question is uh, that uh, the more productive investments by firms and workers' wages and training uh, is more likely during tight labor markets than in recessions uh, or their aftermath. Uh, it doesn't require as much policy intervention to get employers to do those kinds of things when they're competing harder for labor. labor. Uh, and so the question is just, you know, how do we get back to that world uh, as fast and productively as possible? So how do we get tighter labor markets uh, so that employers have that incentive to make those investments? I'll, I'll take the first bit at this. Um, I think part of this answer is quite straightforward. Um, we need another recovery package and we are relief package and we need it now. Um, and I think it's enormously frustrating that Congress has allowed the extended unemployment benefits to expire, that they have not provided aid to the states, that they have not done the things that we need to do for the latter half of this year to push us back towards full employment. But I think even once we get to full employment, the conversation that we were starting at the beginning of 2020 before the pandemic hit was whether full employment was enough. You know, we had seen this was that was the longest economic recovery in recorded US history going back over 100 years. And yet wages were not rising nearly as fast as one might have um, hypothesized a decade before if we had, would have known how low the unemployment rate would have been for as long as it was. And it had not sort of made the inroads into addressing economic inequality that maybe we would have hypothesized. So I think the question that we also have to start asking is full employment is a necessary um, condition for raising wages and for improving, um, for in, in getting, um, uh, encouraging employers to use labor more productively, but what else needs to happen to do that? I'll let Michael weigh in or Derek. Yeah, I I agree with with Heather that we need another another recovery law. Um, I think I think the CARES Act in March was, a, was a big success, uh, but I think we we need more. And this is this is an atypical recession. You know, I mean, I think uh, in 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 a really exaggerated way, uh, in an unusual way, the speed with which we recover from this is a policy choice. Um, unlike uh, a, a typical recession where there's some sort of fundamental imbalance in the economy that needs to be worked through, uh, this, this recession happened because of a, an event from completely outside the economic system, from the, from the pandemic. Um, and so, you know, we can continue to see, I think, uh, rates of job growth, reductions in the unemployment rate, rates of overall economic growth that look a lot more like they did in May and June and a lot less like they did uh, in September if we decide that that's something we want to do. Uh, and it is, it is disappointing to me, to say the least, that, that um, that, that Congress and, and the White House haven't been able to come together on this. Uh, it's, it's particularly perplexing because the, the President Trump seems to want something uh, and, 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 and yet is you know, not able, not able to, to, put, to push that through. Um, you know, then I think uh, uh, what will really matter are making sure that we have policies that support workforce participation, policies that support investment, uh, the kinds of things that we'll need once the pandemic is in the rearview mirror, uh, but, but that we will need in order to to keep the recovery going and, and to kind of enter that final, you know, the final 20 yards of, 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 of the recovery. That should involve not doing unwise things. Um, policies that, that uh, discourage investment. For example, I would not raise the corporate income tax rate uh, as Vice President Biden is, 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 is hoping to do. Uh, policies that, 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 would, that would make investment relatively less attractive, policies that would 
slow down the process of some industries shrinking and some industries expanding and reallocating labor and capital from shrinking industries to expanding industries. I think we want that process to happen as quickly as it can. Uh, and, and we want policies that will, that will increase participation in the workforce and, 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 and not discourage it. Um, we uh, uh, need to have a, an accommodated, uh, accommodative uh, set of macroeconomic policies, Fed policy, fiscal policy, um, because really, I think if you if you want to get the unemployment rate back to where it was, uh, uh, you know, if you want to get it into the fours, for example, uh, you need a hot economy to do that. There's a limit to uh, what uh, social policy can do to achieve that goal. I'm a big believer in social policy. I think social policy can be really helpful. But if you want to get back to, to four and a half percent unemployment, that takes a hot economy and that, and that requires not making policy mistakes. Yeah. I mean, a federal job guarantee would do better than four and a half. It would literally eliminate unemployed, involuntary unemployment. Uh, there's definitely enough infrastructure needs in our country uh, for care economy, for greening our economy, uh, just physical infrastructure in general. It would give existing workers better bargaining power to address the concerns that were raised in the initial question by removing the threat of unemployment. So ultimately it would fulfill FDR's second bill of rights in which he called for guaranteed employment. Artie, and then I'll just last question for you uh, again from the audience. Um, is there anything to be said specifically about industrial policies uh, to help uh, low and moderate wage workers? Are there particular industries that ought to get assistance? Uh, and if so, is there a particularly attractive way of doing that? Um, I can take that one. I think that there, the answer to that is, I think that one of the things that we've learned over 2020 is that not paying attention to the composition of industries and, and what, they, um, what industries are important for our national security, for economic resilience, has left the United States uniquely vulnerable in this crisis to a shock. Um, if there's one thing we know that what climate change is gonna bring in the years to come is um, repeated shocks to our economy. So I think this is the moment to really be thinking about what is that composition of industries that we need to, to make sure that we are a resilient society. Um, I would always start that conversation with two sectors that are incredibly important. One is what are we doing around climate change? How are we encouraging um, all producers in our economy to move towards uh, production methods that are not going to exacerbate climate change, but will hopefully mitigate that? So that is one set of industries that we need to reduce future shocks, which is we've seen in 2020, the U.S. has had a hard time with. But then second, I think, you know, and it can't be said enough, what 2020 has shown is that if the, if the people can't get to work safely, um, either because it's unhealthy or because they don't have care to address um, their, for their children or for um, loved ones, then you really, you, big parts of your economy start to flounder. And so we do need to be thinking about shoring up that part of our society and our economy that can be incredibly expensive for families because they, a lot of families need like infant care or child care when their families are very young and they're earning the lowest wages of their careers. And yet it's so pivotal to um, providing that strong foundation. So I think that 2020 really shows us that resiliency requires attention to that kind of composition. I think we have a false dichotomy that separates industrial policy from labor policy. I think that portable benefits should be part of our industrial policy. I think uh, in general, an industrial policy that is more focused on workers will benefit firms as well. Obviously workers that don't have to worry as much about child care, adult care, elder care. And even if we get health insurance off their ledgers, uh, firms would be more competitive, in my view, and actually uh, improve our economy. So I, I think that we need to redefine industrial policy to not be so centric on firms. And Michael, we have about one half a minute left, if you have anything on that, otherwise. Um, I, uh, I think that there, there, there may be certain national security reasons to have stockpiles of, of certain things or perhaps the ability to produce you know something 
um, from an economic perspective, I think we should be focused on helping workers and not focused on helping industries. Uh, and if there are powerful global macroeconomic forces that make uh, locating a manufacturing plant in the United States relatively unattractive to businesses, uh, tax credits for reshoring and special tax rates for that output and things of that nature, you know, might help on the margin, but they're not going to overpower the, the fundamental uh, uh, macroeconomic environment. And so, you know, that shouldn't be taken as an excuse for complacency. That, that, that instead should be taken as, as an opportunity to think about new policies to help give workers the, the skills and training they need to compete in industries that are growing here at home. Well, great. Well, thanks. So I wish we had time to continue, but, uh, but we've uh, run out of time for this panel. Thank you for, for a wide ranging and interesting discussion. Uh, Jason had to drop off a few minutes ago to do some professor things. Uh, so with his regards, uh, thank you to Heather. Thank you to Derek. Thank you to Michael. Uh, appreciate your contributions to the discussion. Uh, and with that, uh, please allow me, allow me to uh, introduce uh, Lisa Hamilton, uh, who will be moderating the next panel. Uh, Lisa is President and Chief Executive Officer of the Annie E. Casey Foundation. And uh, take it away, Lisa. Thanks so much, Donald. We are going to continue this discussion of how economic outcomes, including upward mobility, are shaped by the opportunities available to workers in the labor market. The pandemic has exposed and exacerbated the challenges that we already knew workers across the nation were facing, especially low-income workers. Challenges like lack of unemployment benefits, paid leave and health care, as well as safe working conditions for frontline, low-wage workers. The health crisis and the ensuing economic turmoil have compounded these inequities, as we can see in the disparate impact of both on communities of color. The senseless killings of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, and far too many other Black Americans at the hands of police have further underscored the longstanding realities of racism in our policies and practices, including in the U.S. labor market. Barriers to opportunity are often treated as the result of individual failure rather than the consequences of the long history of discriminatory practices, such as occupational segregation, mass incarceration, discrimination in hiring and promotion, and the weakening of other forms of worker protections. But when we look at the data, it's clear that these forces have driven the significant and persistent disparities we see, even among workers with higher educational attainment, employment rates, and upward mobility. I wanted to start our conversation with even just a few data points to ground um, our discussion. The black unemployment rate has consistently been twice that of the white unemployment rate since the early 1970s. In 1979, the wage gaps between white workers and black and Latino workers were 17.3% and 18.8% respectively. But by 2019, those gaps had risen to 26.6% and 28.4%. And finally, lower rates of wealth and home ownership means black workers have thin, or non-existent cushion to weather the unexpected, including the unparalleled national and global crisis that we've experienced this year. So our discussion today is going to focus on two broad issues. First, understanding the nature and causes of racial disparities and labor market outcomes. And second, identifying potential solutions to address those disparities and create more equitable opportunities for workers of color. I'm so glad that we have a great uh, panel uh, assembled to uh, participate in our conversation. We have Amanda Cage, who's president and chief executive officer of the National Fund for Workforce Solutions. Sarah Kay, who is vice president of Inclusive Solutions at Prudential Financial. Heidi Sherholz, who is senior economist and director of policy at the Economic Policy Institute. And Tanya Wallace-Goburn, who's the Executive Director of National Black Worker Center Project. Welcome to all of you. Well, Tanya, you are on the front lines of helping Black workers access quality jobs and preventing racial discrimination and employment practices. So I want to start with you. Workers I'm sorry, go ahead. Uh, workers expect that they will or should be treated fairly 
paid for their work at a level commensurate with their effort, get the same pay and benefits as other workers at the same level, and have the opportunity to address any grievances that they have. But historically, and even now, how has this looked different for workers of color? Well, thank you, Lisa. As you can see, I'm eager to, to get started to, and participate in this conversation. I want to just give my thanks also to WorkRise and the Urban Institute for the inter, um, invitation to join this panel discussion. So, so where do we start? Fair treatment and compensation looks different for people of color, I would say, because of racial capitalism. Racial capitalism is the process of deriving social and economic value from the racial identity of another person. It's a long-standing, common, and deeply problematic practice. The process of racial capitalism relies upon and reinforces the commodification of racial identity, thereby degrading that identity by reducing it to another thing to be bought and sold. Commodification can also foster racial resentment by causing non-white people to feel used or exploited by white people. And, and, and as I'm discussing this, whiteness is, is, a, is a kind of status property that can be compared to conventional forms of property. It entitles a person to a suite of legal rights and access to human rights, such as liberties, powers, and immunities that are important for human well-being, including freedom of expression, freedom from bodily harm, and free and equal opportunities to use personal talents. Racial capitalism cheapens cross-racial interaction and cheapens attempts at cross-racial understanding. When race is viewed as a commodity, white people are encouraged to think of non-white people in terms of their instrumental value and not their intrinsic worth. This perception of whiteness as the most valuable sort of property unlocks, if you will, the golden door of opportunity. In the workplace, if you're not white, racial diversity can be regarded as simply another non-essential item, not unlike catered lunches or technology upgrades, things that get sacrificed in times of hardship. So when we think about race as a commodity, that's the easy way out because we think of it like any other thing, a chair or a piece of fruit or something that we can take something that we can consume and do with it what we like. But if we were to value all races equally, that's where the hard conversations began. And, and that's where we have the greatest opportunity to ensure that workers' expectations of fair treatment and fair pay, uh, pay might actually become a reality. Thank you so much, Tanya, for that uh, understanding of how um, this plays out in the workplace. Uh, I think it would be helpful to understand how policy undergirds some of the issues that you talked about. And so I'm going to turn to Heidi um, to talk about how public policies in place today perpetuate disparities in labor market opportunities and outcomes. Neat. Okay. Thank you. I am also delighted to be here. It's an honor to be on this wonderful panel. Um, and that is a great and huge question that you just asked. So what I'm going to do is just focus on a few examples to sort of show the texture of how this works, how this plays out in the labor market. So one key thing is labor standards. Labor standards like the minimum wage are more important to black and Latinx workers than white workers because for a whole host of reasons related to things like occupational segregation, discrimination, other labor market disparities rooted in systemic racism, these workers are more likely to be in very low wage jobs. So when the minimum wage is allowed to erode over time to very low levels in real terms, that hurts black and Latinx workers more than white workers and it exacerbates racial wage gaps. So, so like wh while many states and localities have gone higher, the federal minimum wage right now is $7.25 an hour. It hasn't been raised for more than a decade. In inflation adjusted terms, it is more than 30% below where it was 50 years ago. The negative racial impacts of that are dramatic. A similar thing with unionization. 
unions reduce racial wage gaps because black workers get a bigger boost from being in unions than white workers do. But through attacks on collective bargaining, through legislation, executive rulemaking, the courts, and by failing to update labor law to keep up with increased employer aggressiveness against unions, policy has led to a huge drop in unionization to its current very low levels. And that drop has contributed to increases in racial earnings gaps. And I think I'll just talk about a couple of things we are seeing that have come to the fore with COVID, namely health and safety and unemployment insurance. On health and safety, we know that workers of color are more likely to have been deemed essential workers during the COVID shutdowns and to be having been going to work every day, risking their health and the health of their families. At the same time, the Occupational Safety and Health Administration has refused to put in place a temporary standard to protect workers against the new workplace danger that is COVID-19. In other words, due to weak labor standards, more workers of color are working in dangerous jobs, which means a greater chance of facing not just the health consequences, but also the financial consequences of getting sick. And I'll give just one more example, unemployment insurance. Unemployment insurance is administered at the state level, and there are large disparities in the generosity of benefits across states. The thing is, if you look at a heat map of states with particularly stingy benefits, it looks very much like a heat map that shows where people of color live. The inequality in our UI system has a deeply racial component to it. And relatedly, I have been getting asked a lot lately about what will happen with the economy now that it's clear that the next round of stimulus is not happening anytime soon. And one thing I always note is that the lack of more stimulus will dramatically exacerbate existing racial inequalities. We know black and brown workers have gotten hit harder by this recession. They have seen more lo job loss, have less wealth to fall back on. So when Senate Republicans block more stimulus, including unemployment insurance, it has a very dramatic negative racial impact. Thank you so much, Heidi, for that perspective. So we've talked about how inequities play out um, in a variety of ways, um, both practically and through policy. Um, I'd like to turn to Sarah to provide some corporate perspective on these issues. Um, I think we heard it mentioned in the uh, panel before this one that people often talk about the virtuous cycle that arises when workers are treated well by their employers in the form of outcomes like lower turnover or higher productivity. But how do employer practices often stand in the way of bringing this virtuous cycle to fruition, particularly um, as it relates to racial equity? Thank you, Lisa, and thanks again for having me on the panel with everyone here. Um, I think there are two parts to this question. I think there is question around job quality overall, and that spans racial, socioeconomic, uh, demographics around the fact that everyone should have a good job that provides livable wages, safe working conditions, stable working schedules, benefit that's including health insurance and retirement and wealth building products. Um, employee voice, uh, career progression. And those are some basic fundamental aspects of job quality that I think most of us on this panel and in the audience do have within our own jobs that when we do have a financial emergency, we have some fallbacks that employers are providing. But that's not the norm. I think the majority of jobs that we know out there are low quality jobs and particularly the ones for frontline workers who are essential workers right now through this pandemic don't have those safety nets. So there's a whole question around why employers um, don't have the incentives and the encouragement to provide high quality jobs across the board. And I think that spans policy, I think that spans regulations, and then I think it spans you know, a whole uh, sentiment that you know, shareholder capitalism, shareholder primacy, and the focus on profits has limited employers to be more investing in their employees, to thinking about how do we make sure that employees are resilient through any kind of emergency or pandemic. And then because that the you know the, a lot of the jobs, particularly frontline jobs out there, are impacting people of color um, more predominantly than white workers, there is this racial inequity and this huge racial wealth wealth gap that's being created. And I think 
a lot of the work that's being done around corporations is one recognizing what are our cultures, what are our practices and policies that have been ingrained in each of the companies um, from either their founding, whether it was 150 years ago, like Prudential, or if it's a new company that's starting out. People have been really uncomfortable talking about racial and gender issues. And I think we've made a lot of strides on the gender side and we are just starting to break ground, right, on having these racial conversations about what is the, the, um, the spread in terms of job level, in terms of benefits that are being provided, in terms of career progression opportunities? And I think employers themselves stand in the way of having these really open and honest conversations and really taking a look at their own policies and practices of what's created this type of culture or this type of uh, lack of opportunity or programs that are really dedicated to saying, you know, uh, uh, that every employee should have um, an equitable opportunity to progress in their company rather than thinking about it as, uh, you know, we're opening up this program and, you know, not enough black employees or not enough Hispanic employees are rising to the occasion. And that's a common strain that we hear all the time in corporate America. And it's how do we break that mentality? How do we uh, make sure that people understand that they have to break their own implicit and unconscious biases? I think I would say a good amount of people do not have the intention to say, I'm going to discriminate against a certain population, but there are these inherent biases that exist in our own individual thinking, but also in our corporate practices that we have to unbreak or break, not unbreak. <laughs> Thank you, thank you. Um, well, let me turn to you, Amanda. You um, work with the National Fund for Workforce Solutions and you get to see how um, these practices and policies play out in many communities around the country. Um, even before the pandemic, many were warning that changes in the labor market were going to displace low wage workers. And we've certainly see that, seen that accelerate um, as a result of the pandemic. Uh, and some economists are predicting that some industries may never recover. How do you think the pandemic is going to change or exacerbate existing trends shaping the future of work? And um, how do you think workers of color are going to fare differently? Sure, and thank you for having me. Um, I am particularly honored also to serve uh, along with Tanya as part of the Work uh, Rise Board. So um, in workforce development, we've been talking about the future of work for a very long time. And traditionally, we've been talking about offshoring or outsourcing. Our more recent anxieties have been around automation and artificial intelligence. And what COVID did was put a fast forward, push the fast forward button on that conversation. Overnight, all firms across all industries were given great incentive to figure out how much they could do with as little human interaction as possible. And we know that there are a number of workers who fell on the wrong side of that digital divide. Uh, this is going to be a fundamental, um, have fundamental impact for decades uh, to come. And we're seeing lots of innovations coming through. Um, but again, if you are one of the one third of workers who lack digital skills, and I, I mean digital literacy and digital fluency, this pushes you further behind. And so it's something that we need to think about, again, across all industries. There is not an industry that has been immune to this uh, digital um, acceleration. And in particular, um, not just industries, but our whole digital infrastructure. If COVID did one thing, it was a massive nationwide audit as to how prepared we are for the digital economy, both in terms of people's access to technology, uh, whether it be devices or the, the actual infrastructure uh, that undergirds that, that piece. Um, so that, that's a major change that's happening across all uh, industries. In terms of particular uh, industries, we know that there are some industries that are, have really been put on pause or on hold by COVID. You think about hospitality as one. Uh, hospitality has been an industry where we have made progress in terms of um, economic mobility. If you, are, if you work at a casino or a hotel, or a stadium in my hometown of Chicago, you have a stable union job. Starting, with, you know, starting pay is $20 an hour. Uh, we see people with 10, 15, 20 years seniority. Um, and we need to be worried about losing those jobs. So I'm gonna jump on the bandwagon. Um, I think on the last panel, on this panel, everybody has said we need to think about stimulus. When we drop those people, it is incredibly difficult to get them back up. 
Um, and then finally, I'll just say, you know, as we think about a longer term um, recovery, uh, many of us are concerned about what the, the long term ramifications will be and what industries will see a lot of scarring and how long it will take to get some back some of these jobs. And there are some industries I'm really concerned with. Um, healthcare, obviously, in the middle of the pandemic, we saw lots of shifts and changes in the healthcare industry. Um, healthcare has always had uh, a, a skills gap in terms of not having enough people to, to raise to those ranks. I'm concerned that there'll be a number of people that we will lose uh, because COVID has exposed um, how difficult a job that could be, especially around health and safety. I'm concerned about transportation and government and social services, which are industries that have really provided economic mobility for people, for communities of color, and in particular, um, you know, black uh, black families. It really, those have really been seen as industries that have built, helped build the, the black middle class. So I'm concerned about what happens to those industries over the long term. Thank you so much. Well, you all have given us a great grounding in the challenges that we are facing, everything from racial capitalism and how these structural inequities are holding uh, some workers back, the role of policies and particularly labor standards in protecting uh, workers, um, issues of job quality that uh, and training that corporate America needs to think more deeply about and how we can ensure that workers who may have been in certain industries are going to have a path forward. Um, all extraordinarily important challenges. Um, but at this point, we're going to switch to solutions, which is what I know you all are excited about, and I think our audience is going to be excited about too. And so I'm going to ask each panelist to, to briefly share what principles guide your overall vision for dismantling the many racial inequities that we've talked about, uh, and how you would see increasing opportunity and mobility for low-wage workers of color going forward. Um, we'll come back to you, Tanya, to get us started. Sure, so uh, a principle that guides my vision for dismantling racial inequities is the advancement of anti-racist and equitable policies both short and long-term to dismantle um, these persistent racial, gender, and economic inequities um, and other barriers to non-dominant groups and that um, non um, dot, excuse me, that non-dominant groups and identities experience. We can do this by examining and re-examining the negative effects of programs and policies, especially when BIPOC communities have less access to the benefits provided through these programs and policies. We have to test the evidence and our assumptions. We have to evaluate whether a law, regulation, or practice is helping reduce racial inequities or perpetuating them. We must also disaggregate the data to provide policymakers with the insights that they need to develop targeted solutions to ensure more equitable outcomes. Thank you, I appreciate that. Um, Heidi, why don't you weigh in on um, what kind of principles guide your overall um, approach to this work and, and what solutions do you see that would be helpful? Okay, yeah, I, um, one of the things that, that one guiding principle for me takes a, a tiny bit of explanation. So I'll start there and others on the panel have already expertly weighed in on this. But the, the thing is, um, I think a lot of people look at wage inequality by race and ethnicity on one hand, and at the fact that people with more education and training make more on average than people with less education and training on the other hand and think, excellent, this can solve that. If we get black and Latinx people more education and training, we can solve inequality by race and ethnicity. And I get why people jump to that conclusion, but when you look deeper, you can see that it doesn't work. Black and Latinx workers have lower earnings than white workers at all levels of education and training. So even if we fully close education gaps, which we should definitely work on doing, but even when we do fully close education gaps, we would still have huge disparities. So one of my key principles for dismantling racial inequity is that we need to look beyond education and training to address the things that mean white workers and workers of color have unequal power in the labor market, even when they have the exact same level of education. So that means things like 
occupational segregation, discrimination, weak labor standards in institutions, and on and on. Those things are harder to address. But I, I just, for, I think, in my view, it's only in tackling those things that we can truly dismantle racial inequalities and increase opportunity and mobility for low wage workers of color. Thank you. Sarah, what are your principles and how, how do you think about uh, solutions to the challenges we've outlined? Yeah, I think from the employer perspective, I think one of the principles that all companies that have been around for quite some time have to think about is like, what is our role in structural racism and the history of how we've uh, contributed to that? And we've taken a hard look at ourselves um, and the role that we played in race-based underwriting. And how do we make sure that we are not just focusing on how do we help support the future, but are, we're also focusing on how do we right the wrongs that we've played in this uh, history. And so I think a big part of corporate America is recognizing your own role and understanding how to make the advances to make sure that that doesn't happen again and that you're righting those wrongs. Um, at the same time, looking at your internal policies and practices around how do you mitigate racial bias, whether it's in your hiring, your retention, your development programs, but also our product development, how we're marketing things, how we're actually, who are our actual end users of our products, and as it is it actually creating wealth in the products that we are purporting that we are doing. And so I think at the same time, though, we have a lot of deep partnerships, like with Amanda and the National Fund around thinking about how do you help build a field, both on the workforce development side, but also on the corporate side of incentivizing companies to create good jobs. Like I think at the end of the day, that is a really big piece of closing the racial wealth gap of providing equitable benefits and services and wages to make sure that everybody has the opportunity to not only build stability, but also mobility, whether they choose to stay in those current companies or, be, or move on to other ones as well. And how about you, Amanda? Yeah, so um, I'm, I'm going uh, to uh, agree with some of my fan fellow panelists. I think uh, first and foremost is disaggregating data. What we have learned is that different communities experience the economy in fundamental different ways. And when you blend those folks and you don't look at the distinct differences between racial groups and within racial groups, you miss all of those pieces. And so I, I really encourage folks to really focus on thinking about ways we can get better at disaggregating data so that we can get to solutions. Um, and then I think there's just a principle of do no harm. Um, you know, just to talk a little bit about Sarah, Sarah's point about practices, you know, there's policy solutions and there, there are practices as well. And for employers, a lot of what we think of as being sort of fundamental race neutral policies really are uh, de facto discrimination. So I'll, I'll give you a couple examples. You know, one is, and we'll see a lot of this as we head into a recession and um, there's scarcity around jobs. It's very common for employers to sort of slap a bachelor's degree um, requirement on a job description. The moment they do that, you are eliminating 76% of African Americans, 83% of Latinx folks. 81% of rural Americans and two thirds of our nation's veterans. So even though that seems sort of like a benign practice, it really does um, change who can come in the door, right? Um, similarly to uh, criminal records, you know, if the racial reckoning that this country has seen over the last couple of months, it has really shown uh, uh, what it looks like to have over criminalization in communities of color in community of color, people have much more negative interaction with criminal, with the police, and that shows up in their records. And so again, it is very common for uh, companies to include criminal background checks of all kinds for all positions. And just know that when you do that, you are inviting the, pre the prejudices that many of us saw happen in this country and were rep repulsed and repelled by, you are inviting that into your uh, place of employment. So there are ways that people can really think about what they do and things that seem to be race neutral that really have a disparate negative effect on people of color. Those are really some great principles, everything from what we often refer to as racial equity impact assessments. Tanya, how do you look at how different groups are impacted by practices or policies? And um, Heidi, for you to um, note that it's not just about raising um, 
educational gaps, but that we've really got to get under the policies that are creating um, disparate impact. And um, Sarah, for you to really talk about the understanding history that companies uh, need to look at in order to um, understand how they can go forward and better serve their companies, uh, better serve their customers and create uh, more effective uh, products and services. And uh, Amanda, I come from Casey, so of course, disaggregating data resonates uh, deeply with uh, with us, but uh, that that uh, mandate to do no harm, I think, is, is really very instructive. Um, before we turn to some of the questions that have been put in the chat box, I want to give each of you um, an opportunity to um, provide one or two specific things that you think can be done to undo racial inequities in the labor market and maybe what you think will even be required to facilitate that. Um, maybe we'll go in a different order this time. Sarah, maybe I'll, I'll start with you. Sorry, to find the mute button again. Um, yeah, I think a couple of specific things that companies can do is be public with their data. So, uh, and that's something that we're working. So I am speaking saying that for my own company as we're working to make our data more transparent because people don't know where the inequities lie, whether it's around racial lines, gender lines, or whatever they may be, if we're not publicly releasing that data. And I mean data across multiple levels, you know, how many people of color are at different positions, how many people of color are at the C-suite, at our board level, but also directors, managers, do we have programs that are developing uh, people of color within our company, um, thinking about turnover and all of those kind of hiring statistics, but then also looking at uh, our customers, our customer base, and you know, are our products being utilized by people of color, and are they actually helping? You know, we we are a financial wellness provider, so life insurance, retirement, emergency savings. These are products that we put out into the market, and are they actually being utilized um, by multiple demographics? I think that's a really be and and pay equity. I should also mention is also really key, right? Those are a lot of the pushes that corporate America is moving forward. At the same time, I think, you know, we have a whole future of work initiative internally, too, as we're going through a transformation as a company. But I think at the same time that companies do need to think about what's going to happen in the future, we need to focus on what's happening in the now. And that's not even much more prevalent given the pandemic. But even pre-pandemic, there are inequities and there are challenges and crises that our employees are facing currently. And so how do we make sure that as companies are transforming for the future and that has to happen, that we are taking care of what's happening at the foundation of the challenges that our employees are facing today? Thank you. Um, Heidi, how about you? Okay, yes, thank you. That um, the in policy changes that I want, I'll focus on policy because that's my area of expertise, but I think it's worth noting that the policies I'm gonna talk about won't pass without a huge amount of organizing. But that said, the, the set of policies that I think would, would be some of the most important policies for dismantling, dismantling racial inequity and increasing opportunity and mobility for low and middle wage workers of color are policies that would boost unionization. Why? Unions help shrink racial wage gaps. And I Oops. workers who are in unions get a larger boost to wages from being in a union than white workers do. We just updated these numbers. The overall union premium is 11.2%, meaning that workers in unions make 11.2% more than workers who aren't in unions who have the same characteristics. But that premium is even higher at 13.7% for black workers. Further, black workers are more likely than white workers to be represented by a union. And these two facts together mean that unions today help narrow the black white wage gap. And I think importantly, it's, it's useful to note that research shows that this phenomenon isn't new. Starting in the mid 1940s, black workers began to be more likely to be in unions than white workers and to have a larger union premium than white workers. So this means that the decline of unionization over the last 40 years has played a significant role in the expansion of the black white wage gap over that period. And I think when, when, whenever anyone talks about the decline of unionization, I think it's always useful to point out that the decline in unions is not because workers don't want unions. 
roughly half of non-union workers report that they would vote for a union in their workplace if they were given the opportunity. So that brings up the question, why is there such a huge gap between what workers want and actual unionization rates? And a key reason is employer aggressiveness against union organizing. Fighting union representation has been a primary goal of corporate executives and shareholders in recent decades. And these interests have convinced many conservative policymakers to attack collective bargaining through legislation, executive rulemaking, the courts, while other policymakers have often just turned a blind eye to those attacks, not updating labor law to counteract aggressive employer practices. So policies to boost unionization, starting with the PRO Act, which passed the House last year, will go a long way. The PRO Act does things like banning so-called right to work laws, it improves the right to strike. It establishes a process for reaching a first contract. It bans captive audience meetings, establishes penalties for businesses who violate labor laws and on and on. We should also make sure that the rights and protections of labor law are extended to currently excluded groups that are disproportionately people of color, including jobs in agriculture and many domestic workers. So together, these kinds of policies would boost unionization and then as a result, help dismantle racial inequality and increase opportunity and mobility for low and middle wage workers of color. Thanks Heidi for that policy perspective. Uh, Amanda, I'll turn to you. Yeah, so I want to jump back to Heidi's um, point earlier, which is, you know, training and education, which is often seen as a panacea to these problems, is just insufficient. And I, um, within the, the field of workforce development, we've been sort of complicit in that conversation that, you know, it's a, we can train people for better jobs. And part of that has been uh, a willingness to accept low quality jobs as long as we could train people out of them. And I think we need to move past that narrative. There must be a floor of quality jobs that we expect for all workers, regardless of their educational attainment, regardless if it's an entry level entry level position. Because we know that even when we bring people in and we train them, the, 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 even though we talk about career ladders and we've really um, been able to articulate what some of those uh, stackable credentials are within different occupations and industries, you know, some of those rungs are just broken. And it is very difficult for low wage workers to invest the time, their time, their talent, their money in um, furthering their training. So I think we just need to um, focus on job quality as a fundamental baseline for what we expect and talk to employers it, it, within my field about that, those expectations. Um, I also think we need to really tackle um, occupational segregation. It is just the fundamental structure by which so many of these racial in inequities uh, perpetuate. And um, it's around stereotypes and longstanding ideas about who belongs and what kind of jobs, what jobs people have access to, what people see in terms of uh, their families and their communities about what's possible for them. And I think we really need to, within workforce development in particular, think about expanding how we think about coaching people in careers, helping them understand the variety of occupations that are available to them, working with employers to be culturally competent. So when those workers come into your place of employment, uh, they are um, accepted and welcomed and not do not feel like they're in a, a hostile environment. I think those are things that um, would really help start to tear down some of these issues. Thank you. And Tanya, you'll have the last word on uh, solutions before we go to some of the questions in the chat box. All right, thank you. I want to piggyback on something that Heidi said about policy not passing without a huge amount of organizing. There's an old refrain that says, there will be nothing about us without us. And that for me sums up organizing in a nutshell. And that's the thing that, um, that we at the National Black Worker Center really lift up and give a lot of attention to. So organ, social justice, organizing, and base building are intimately connected. Collective action through organizing generates the social power needed to overcome unjust social conditions and achieve changes that further human rights. People of color have to organize ourselves and that's because nobody else is going to do it for us. Organizing for social justice fosters equal human rights, disruptive justice, and is grounded in representative and participatory democracy. 
The collective action of organizing by community members draws on the goals of demonstrating the power of strength in numbers and creates indigenous leadership to decrease power disparities and achieve shared goals for social change. When community members actively participate, the lived experience and local knowledge that they bring to problem solving processes usually results in better ideas and solutions. Participatory process draws on the strengths of grassroots leaders who can engage other community assets and resources. These influential individuals also have the power to mobilize a base of supporters instead of opponents. Additionally, community participation provides access points for new emerging community leaders to develop their experience, confidence, and skills, thereby building community capacity, which increases voluntary action through, again, people power and ensures greater sustainability and staying power due to the increased commitment and follow through by community members. So the one thing that I would add, because we've had some discussion about unions um, and this um, panel so far is, I believe that we don't need a siloed labor movement. We need a unified worker movement. One of my critiques of the labor movement stems from workers' inability to take that union contract with them should they change employers. And so it, it causes us to question where exactly is the power? Does it lie solely with the contract or at a particular con company? Or can we, and can we shift that power so that it is within the employee and no matter where they work, no matter the industry, they don't lose that organized power. And I think that's the direction that we, we need to go in. Thank you so much and for um, responding to one another. Well, we've got some good questions in the chat box. So I am going to uh, toss them out and ask some of you to respond. So the first is, um, is it better to focus on universal policies like guaranteed employment or targeted policies at this moment of economic, political, and social instability? Would anyone like to take that one on? Universal versus targeted strategies. I'll, I'll, I'll try a crack at it. I, you know, I think this is a fundamentally um, important question at this moment in time. Uh, I think there is something to be said for universalism. Some of the conditions uh, that we see for workers of color and low uh, wage workers are, are happening to number of workers across the board. Um, you know, we're seeing more precarious employment with high skilled workers. We're seeing, uh, you know, more health and safety concerns at different levels of the uh, income distribution. So I do think there's a level of universalism that that does, you know, sort of rise all boats. And we and we need to restore some of the the. Um, the things that we have lost ground on in the last 20, 30 years in this country. That said, and I, and I leave it to the private sector for that. And I, there's the, also the, the, you know, universal policies get more political support, right? We know that about, you know, you know public policies like social security or, or Medicare, um, you know, when, when people universally have access to those programs, there's more public support. Um, that said, I would challenge, especially folks in the private sector and folks who represent uh, foundations or other uh, worker organizer, or worker organizing organizations to think about targeted responses in that space. Because the different, like I said before, the difference and the explanation for um, the, the differences and the barriers for different populations look very different. And if we're going to see, solve those problems and be um, responsive, we really need to see what's going on and um, customize a solution for that. So I think it's a, it's a both. Let's, let's have the policies and the public folks do universal stuff and then uh, really have other people really look at the, the, targeted, um, the targeted aspect. Does anyone else want to weigh in on that? There's actually another question that relates to um, that, and I'll toss it out. Maybe it'll encourage someone else to respond um, to both. And it's how should we be thinking about the multiple identities that so many workers of color hold? 
for example, in terms of gender, age, immigration status, and disability that might be intersecting to create additional challenges in the labor force. So I think it's so, sort of even another dimension to um, what you offered, uh, Amanda, that um, there are many identities that workers um, might have that might be creating challenges in the, the workplace. So I'll, I'll ask any of the others of you if you'd like to uh, uh, comment on this universal versus targeted strategies, um, knowing that there are so many other identities that workers hold. I have a comment and I'll try to figure out if I can do, if I can incorporate in the identity question because it was more about the universal versus targeted but we'll see how this goes. So I, t I absolutely 100% agree with Amanda about the importance of both. So that's the, like first and foremost, that's we need to do both. I do think in this right now, in the crisis that we're facing, the, the when the next president comes into office, the most dramatic economic problem that, that, the, that we're facing right now is going to be just a lack of demand for workers. We just have a weak economy. And so in a case like this, we know that um, universal policies like fiscal stimulus, aid to state and local governments, um, unemployment insurance, though, like the, the kinds of things that will help boost the economy, get it back on track, while also in the case of unemployment insurance, getting aid to people who have been hardest hit. Those things are universal, but will by far disproportionately help um, Black and Latinx workers because Black and Latinx workers have been hit, hit the hardest by this recession. So there is, I think in this moment, I. I, I answer this question as, as un, more, I would, I would lean more towards universal in this moment. And then as the recovery more takes hold, it's like going to the, the both answer is absolutely the right place to be. Thank you so much. I have a question that's probably um, best directed to Sarah. And it's about how can we talk to employers about determining the monetary value of jobs and making sure wages more accurately reflect the ROI of their work, particularly those roles that are now clearly illuminated as essential. Yeah, it's a great question. I think, um, and Amanda can also speak to this because we've done a lot of work with the National Fund and other organizations around this on really helping workforce development organizations better understand how to talk to employers about it. I think we need more data on productivity and turnover and retention costs because I think that's huge. If you can prove that retaining and developing an employee is far cheaper than having to go through another hiring practice and onboarding and then losing that employee over and over again. Um, there are real price uh, expenses that um, show financial value in terms of the incentives of um, getting employers to think about job quality. But I think at the core of it, you know, there's a moral and a business imperative that you have to get to on both sides, a moral imperative that everybody de deserves a livable wage and employers should be providing that. And the business imperative is that financial value of investing in that employee and making sure that they are provided with the right benefits. Because we know we do pulse of American workers, we do a financial wellness uh, census every year, and it always shows that employees spend at least 25 to 40 percent of their time worrying about financial challenges while they're on the job. That has immediate impact on their productivity at the job level. We are working with NYU actually right now with the Center for, uh, for Sustainable Business on a research study that's looking at the top uh, 250 companies, I believe, and looking at do their financial returns reflect the quality of jobs that they're providing their workers. And so we hope that that's a, a research point that we can put out there for workforce organizations, practitioners, and policymakers to really utilize to say, hey, if you provide good jobs for your employees and you invest in their talent and their development, these are the types of financial returns that you'll go through. And because we started this research project pre-COVID-19, but because of COVID-19, we're also gonna look at the resiliency. Do companies fare better when we go through a crisis or emergency when they do provide better jobs for their employees? And so I think, you know, we, we have to help disseminate more best practices, messaging, talking points, getting out the financial data, but we're also you know, working with research partners to make sure that people have the right tools and the backup evidence to show that good jobs do provide good financial returns for companies overall. Awesome, thank you. Amanda, do you want to amplify or add yeah, to anything Sarah said? 
I will add um, everything to, to what Sarah said, and especially um, making the business case. And there's an incredibly strong business case for investing in your workers. But I just wanted to say in this, in this moment of crisis of COVID, one of the things that we've really seen is um, the vulnerability of workers to their employers became very transparent to folks. And so financial wellness guide, something that we've worked with uh, Sarah for a long time on helping companies think about providing uh, financial wellness programs to, to their employees. Um, the uptick in the, in the uh, take up of, that, of those guides has really soared during these COVID times. We know that most workers, you know, according to the Federal Reserve study, most workers, 40% of workers could not handle a $400 expense. Um, and I, I think more and more employers are seeing that in uh, seeing their workers live that and wanting to respond. We got a, a very interesting question about um, technology and its role in furthering racial gaps. Um, and the question is, do employers understand what biases are introduced by applicant tracking systems and resume screening software? And we've all been so aware, made aware of the digital divide at, uh, at this time. So. Um, Anyone want to weigh in on uh, technology and its role in um, limiting access um, to low wage workers or, or people of color to opportunity? And you might I'm, to, I'm happy to start working. again. I didn't want to be the one answering all the questions, but I'll start and then if anybody wants to jump in. Uh, it's a really great point, and it's something that we're looking at very closely. I will say there are pros and cons to technology playing a role in our recruiting and hiring process. Before, we had a very targeted campus recruiting strategy. You had to be a student on these specific colleges to even find out if we had job openings, entry-level job openings at our company. The role that technology has played is completely dismantling that. Now anybody can search for a job um, at Prudential and you don't have to be a student at a specific college. So in that way, it's been really great in helping um, open access and increase access. On the flip side of things, you know, we are looking at how do we make sure, because what the technology does is, right, it's taking your top performers at the company and saying these are the qualities that people need to have to perform well, and then they're applying it on the resumes um, that are coming in. So we have to make sure that we are, you know, modeling what we consider a really good employee, making sure that there is race and uh, ethnic demographics that are embodied in that and they're not creating these biases. I think on the flip side of that, I'll keep going back and forth in terms of the good and the bad is that we have now, you know, interviews were very subjective. If that interviewer or recruiter was having a really great day and they met five people that they loved, they came back and said, these are the five great candidates. If they were having a really bad day or if they had their own biases that they didn't even realize, they would make comments and make subjective opinions on people. Now we have a, you know, a panel of five to eight people looking at the exact same interview at the exact same responses. And so you can try to mitigate some of that subjective bias that comes into play when it's one-on-one -on -one because now we have multiple people looking at the same responses for a candidate. And so I would say there's 100% a lot of flaws and gaps that we have to mitigate for in technology, but there's also a lot of good things that are happening with technology that I think is increasing access helping to mitigate some of the individual biases that might exist and really helping uh, talent acquisition, our talent acquisition team, really think about across that whole spectrum because before they just had a certain process and they were very embedded to that. And now they're, because there's this new technology platform, they are more inclusive in who they are um, having as their interviewers and thinking about the interview questions and embedding more people involved in that. Tanya, I wanted to invite you into this conversation, given that you do work around um, trying to prevent discrimination uh, in employment practices. Thank you, Lisa. I appreciate that. And I want to um, take it in a, a little bit of a different direction. And it's, it's around the realities that workers understand the, the new technologies that are coming about, and they are wanting to increase their skill set, their knowledge, their certification, their training. But where we see a gap at is there is no easy way to assess what training programs are the ones that are necessary and will lead to, to, to a particular job. There's no way to, there's no easy way to understand what are the jobs of the future and what are the skills that would be necessary in order for you to um, be applicable for, for this particular form of employment. I would, I, it, it baffles me, right? I think that it should be as, 
as easy as if I wanted to go on vacation and I was looking for a hotel, I could go online, right, the kayak or whatever, and do a quick search and have an understanding of what hotels were available, get an assessment, understand exactly what, what I am going to pay for. We don't have that same sort of technology, and we should have that. So workers should have that same technology so that they have an understanding of these are the jobs of the future, these are the skills that are required, and these are the accredited, accredited training programs that you should inv invest your time and resources in. I bet Amanda has something to say to that, or maybe he <laughs> does, as um, you work in spaces trying to make these employer um, employee matches um, with the credentials and, uh, and qualifications. Yeah, I think um, making that, you know, when we talk about making real time like labor market information available to people in a way that's digestible and ways that they can consume. Um, I think that like, like I said before, I think that's critical to making sure that we can um, interrupt uh, occupational segregation, right? There are tons of people out there who should be web developers or cybersecurity analysts or physical uh, therapy aides who may not even know about that job and what that job um, entails and what kind of credentials you need and what that job pays. Um, I would say, you know, work, I, I work within the workforce system and there are workforce boards around the country who do a very good job of, of, of that. Um, they do it with people who happen to walk into their um, facilities looking for services. Uh, but they're able to articulate to those folks um, what they should, uh, you know, what industries and occupations they should connect with and how they go about doing that. We don't have a universal way to, to for that to happen and it shouldn't be done on a case by case basis. We do need something more universal for both, you know, young people, you know, we don't have that within the college system either. Uh, for people who are going through any kind of investment in education, how do we make sure people are making uh, smart decisions uh, because it is a significant investment, uh, again, of time, talent, and money. Great, thank you. I have uh, another, oh, go ahead, Tiny. Jump in quickly on the jobs, because I, I just loved everything everyone said, and then there's, like, there's so much to talk about with technology, but another thing that I think is important when you're talking about technology and work is when there's a big power imbalance between employers and workers, which is what we have in this country, when since we've allowed things like labor standards and institutions to erode so dramatically over the last four decades, employers can, in some cases, just use technology as a cudgel to further increase their power. So you see things like technology that allows for micro tracking of workers. Um, that is much more, it's, it's because of occupational segregation, it's going to be much more likely to be used against workers of color than white workers. And, and if micro tracking of workers, I'm talking about like um, warehouse workers who are being forced to wear watches that tell where they are at any time and making sure that they're, that, you know, they're never taking breaks or congregating with other employees where they might be talking about organizing or, or those kinds of things. Um, or employers asserting that workers who are connected via digital platforms are not employees with all the rights and protections that go along with being an employee, but are instead independent contractors, even when the employer has a great deal of control over their conditions of work, like Uber, Lyft, that kind of thing. Um, technology that allows for just-in-time on-call scheduling, it's terrible for workers who then can't plan for things like childcare or taking another job or attending classes, that kind of thing. So those those kinds of things um, are, are are the, the, the harmful thing in there is really employer power, employers being able to use the technology against workers. And, I, and I, I, it, it does point to the need to, to, to broadly boost worker power because we know that the, the workers who will have those kinds of things used against them the most will be Black and Latinx workers. Thank you so much, Heidi. I'm going to ask one last question. We've got about 45 seconds left, and it's um, sort of bringing it back to work rise. And one of the focuses of work rise is the importance of data in making change. And so the qu final question is how we should incorporate racial equity when it comes to the actual data we use. And it could be by employers, by policymakers, practitioners, or organizers. Anyone want to weigh in on that one? I would just say everybody has their metrics. Wherever you're coming from, you have some core metrics that matter to you. Um, 
that you need to look at those, you know, again, broken record here, disaggregated data. You've got to look at your core metrics, whatever they are for you and the organization that you sit in and the goals you have created for yourself to make sure you are hitting those metrics for all people equally. And I, and I can almost guarantee you, you're not. Thank you so much. You all have been an incredible panel to both help us understand the dimensions of the challenges we face, but to also lift up some phenomenal solutions and levers that we can uh, utilize to try to improve opportunities for low wage workers and workers of color in this economy. Thank you all so much for being with us and thank you to all of the participants who were able to join us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.